uh, apparently all hell broke loose last week, um, and I was off for the last three days of the week. I want to start by responding to this op-ed, because I've gotten a lot of mail about it while I was out. And there was a full op-ed in the New York Times coming after me personally, as well as the Daily Wire, uh, from a, a woman named Jane Coates, uh, Jane Coaston, Jane Coaston. Obviously, I don't know her work very well, so I can't speak to the rest of her work, but basically, the idea was that uh, I am somehow a guy who only panders to the right, and this is the hallmark of the right these days, is just pandering to the right. Uh, what I do know from Jane Coaston is that she is a lefty. She, she's a liberal. Uh, and, and Jane Coaston uh, has written pieces like this one from MTV News titled, quote, On the Punching of Nazis, subtitle, I Support It. This is back in January. She said, if a Nazi is in your presence, can you ever punch the Nazi in the god dang face? The answer is simple. Of course you can. And then she says that, should you? Yes. Yes, you should. You should punch Nazis in the god dang face. You should do so repeatedly. If you see more Nazis, you should punch them too. So she sounds like a, a very tolerant and diverse individual, which is just wonderful. Uh, and she titled her piece on me, The Hollow Bravery of Ben Shapiro. So the first thing is that I would just like to note here, I have never called myself brave. Uh, in fact, I don't really consider myself brave because I reserve that title for law enforcement, you know, people who put themselves in harm's way to protect others. I'm a guy who goes on campus and I give talks and I have security and I'm probably the safest guy in the room, as I've said in a thousand interviews. So for me, my job is not about bravery. My job is about saying things that I think are true and then you take them or you leave them. Um, you know, the, the idea that I have ever proclaimed that I am you know, the hallmark uh, of bravery is just absurd. But the piece itself is really designed to attack the entire conservative movement uh, and, uh, and me as sort of a, a supposed thought leader in it. So here is what Jane Coaston writes. She writes, Ben Shapiro, the conservative writer, prides himself on speaking bold truths to liberal power. His shtick goes something like this. Set up a speech in a progressive bastion, ideally a college campus full of coastal elites who have never left their bubble. Spar with snowflakes who are offended by something he says about race or gender or perhaps even believe he never should have been invited in the first place. Post the exchange on the internet and use it as proof that the cultural consensus is stacked dramatically against conservatives. As Mr. Shapiro has put it, the left has run out of aggressors to target. Instead, they've become the aggressor's self-righteous morality police dedicated to wiping out dissenting thought. Well, the reason I say that is because Berkeley, like the University of California, run by Janet Napolitano, a Democrat, staffed entirely by Democrats at the highest level, decided that I needed 600 police officers in order to speak at Berkeley. As I've said, again, 1,000 times, the year before I showed up with no security. I had my security team, but there were no police officers necessary. It's not me that's making this issue on campus. It is not I. I am not the one who is who's designing these problems on college campuses, nor do I even like them. I mean, you can talk to people from my team. They will tell you before we do every lecture. I say, I really hope this one is nice and calm. And as far as the idea that I don't want to have people in the room with whom I can discuss, I've been debating people on the left for a long time here. I mean, I debated Cenk Iger like two, maybe three months ago. Uh, I debated uh, a panel of people, including uh, the NAACP president in Spokane, Washington, and Charles Mudady from the Seattle Stranger when I was up in Seattle. Uh, I debated Shama Sawant, who was the who was the Socialist City Council member in Seattle. Uh, I, I'm going to have a discussion with Sam Harris, with whom I strenuously disagree on religion. Uh, I'm going to have a discussion with him up in San Francisco in December. In fact, I'm hard pressed to think of many people on the right who debate people on the left more than I do, like high ranking people on the left more than I do. I debated Sally Cohn last year. Like, I debate people on the left all the time. This idea that I'm out there looking for snowflakes to melt is just patently absurd. In fact, I've said in my own lectures, I said in the Berkeley lecture, I believe, I said that the easiest thing in the world is to find some college leftists to trigger, but that's not my job. My job is to say things I think are true in front of audiences full of leftists and conservatives. I wish more people who are on the left would show up. I mean, I always, I have a standing rule. Look at every one of my lectures for the last year and a half. I have a standing rule. If you disagree with me, raise your hand and go to the front of the line. That is my standing rule. The idea that I'm not out there trying to convert people, that I'm not out there trying to do outreach, that all I care about is the viral videos that come from these exchanges, it's just, like there, there's no evidence to this whatsoever. In any case, uh, Jane Coates, Coaston says, quote, It's true that campuses tend to be hostile places to conservatives like Mr. Shapiro, Charles Murray, and Heather McDonald, but the notion that they're the cultural underdogs is bogus. Really? We're not the cultural underdogs. Heather McDonald and Charles Murray aren't the cultural underdogs. When Charles Murray went to Middlebury College, a leftist professor, I think, broke her collarbone, thanks to the students over there. Charles Murray was just shut down again over the weekend. We're not the cultural underdogs. Have you seen the culture? You might, you might say we're not the political underdogs. I think that they're, that's, that's sort of true. I mean, in Berkeley, I am the political underdog, but across the country, I don't think I am, because I think that the vast majority of people agree with most of what I have to say, but... 
the notion that we're not cultural underdogs is absurd. She says, what Mr. Shapiro does on campus is shadow boxing, meant to pander to his conservative fans whose values dominate mainstream American culture. Okay, no evidence that, that conservative values dominate mainstream American culture. In fact, virtually all of the evidence is on the other side. On all of the major social issues of the day, without, uh, perhaps aside from abortion, uh, there's no question that there is a leftist slash liberal consensus on cultural issues. She said, if he wants to be genuinely brave, he challenged some of the wrong-headed ideas <coughs> held by his right-wing fans. Instead, he uses his megaphone, the, da the website The Daily Wire, to reinforce what they already believe. Okay, a couple of things here. The idea that I don't challenge wrong-headed ideas held by some of my fans. Again, you have to be ignorant of my work in order to say this. Fully ignorant of my work in order to say this. For the last two years, I've taken a very controversial position with regard to President Trump, who, lest Jane Coast didn't forget, is rather popular among people who support me. I've, I've, I was the initiator of Good Trump, Bad Trump. I created Good Trump, Bad Trump. Right? I'm the guy who had on my desk for months a shoe. We called it the put it on the other foot sh uh, shoe, right? We, we actually took this shoe, and when Trump would do something, I would say, put the shoe on the other foot. Imagine Obama did it, and then let's try and see whether this is something that's good or not. Right? I've been very critical, not only of President Trump, but I wrote a piece this morning about why it's bad for a bunch of MAGA-hatted dummies to, to shut down a, a liberal speaker, a leftist speaker, Xavier Becerra, the, the Attorney General of California, over at Whittier College. Now, the idea that I don't criticize people on, on the so-called right side of the aisle is patently absurd. Again, I've criticized the alt-right incessantly, repeatedly. When I left Breitbart, I criticized Steve Bannon. I criticized Steve Bannon when he was appointed to the, to the campaign. Um, th this, I don't know where she's getting this, um, but all I will say is that it is utterly in disconnect with reality. And anybody who watches the show knows that that is the case. Anybody who listens to the show knows this is the case. We try to be intellectually honest about our conservatism. It seems to me that what Jane Coaston really wants is for me to be on the left. This is the same critique that I heard from a lot of people on the left, who didn't like the Never Trump Republicans because they said, why don't you just vote for Hillary? Because Hillary's awful. Okay, Jane, just because I disagree with some people on the right about things doesn't mean I have to agree with your crappy point of view. Okay, if, if your idea of dissent is that I have to agree with you, then I dissent from your dissent. Okay, no. I think you're wrong. I think that most of the stuff that you write is wrong. And guess what? I can do that. Maybe the reason I disagree with you is because I think you're wrong. So what does she use as the example of us pandering? So she picks one example, right? This one example that has been used by the left over the last week when I was on vacation. <clears throat> so she says, on Monday, the Daily Wire published a video that depicted Native Americans as animated savages before the arrival of Christopher Columbus. In one slide, the video lists Native American achievements as consisting of dream catchers, tomahawks, and cannibalism, while stating that Columbus's arrival in 1492 assured the arrival of math and the iPhone, and then she says the animated video was actually the second one the Daily Wire posted this past weekend on the subject. The other carried the sub subtle title, quote, Christopher Columbus actually was a great man. So the second video, I think, is actually quite good. The second video is from Michael Knowles, and it is a full breakdown of the entire history of Christopher Columbus. It is full of information. Coaston, of course, just takes it for granted that Christopher Columbus was a bad guy, so I'm sure she didn't even bother to watch the video, which is chock full of references to actual primary documentation. You should go watch Knowles' video. It has over a million hits. It is quite good. The other video, I didn't like. It didn't meet editorial standards. I was on vacation. As soon as I found out about it, I wanted to pull it down. It was a satire video. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, I, I was conflicted in the sense that I don't like pulling down satire. I, I think that satire, you get a broader range than, than just you would in a normal video. And so I made the mistake of leaving it up for 24 hours. Over that 24 hours, I became increasingly disconcerted with the video. I really was not a fan of it at the beginning. Over the next 24, 25 hours, uh, I, I really I watched it a few more times and found that it, it crossed lines for me that I didn't want crossed. Uh, and I took it down and I issued an apology personally for the video being on the site in the first place. Which is, as far as I'm aware, what you are supposed to do when a bad video goes up on your site. So, okay, if I, if I, if I really wanted to not take off my right-wing fans, I would have left the thing up, wouldn't I? And then, Coaston spends the next, like, three paragraphs talking about not the Daily Wire, but the Federalist, the, the site run by a friend of mine, Ben Dominich. And uh, she talks about uh, this, the, the, daily, the, the Federalist pandering to the right. Forgetting, of course, that the Federalists has run a number of pieces disagreeing on major issues with other members of the right, that the Federalist has a pretty wide variety of opinion. Mary Catherine Hamm, who was a never-Trumper, is on that site. So is Molly Hemingway, who's a very pro-Trump writer, is on that site. And then what does she use as her example of real pandering? She said that publication had a black crime tag on its website until two weeks ago, which included an article titled, If You Don't Want Police to Shoot You, Don't Resist Arrest. Um, and, uh, and so a couple of things on that. Number one, black crime tags. Tags, you know... Most of the editors at a site don't know that the tag is there, right? A tag is an HTML thing. It's not like 
every single story gets filed away as a black crime story, there's a tag that somebody in the back end is hitting that puts the HTML in black crime for this site. Now, I don't think there should be a black crime tag, neither did the Federalist, which is why they removed it. Okay, but again, this whole idea here is that conservatives are just catering to their base. Now, what I love about this article is that Jane Coaston is catering to her leftist base in the New York Times. So this entire article is not a rebuke to anyone on the left. It's not her speaking truth to power on the left. It's not her saying to the left that people like me should be able to speak at Berkeley. No, instead, it's Jane Coaston pandering to her own leftist readers and then accusing us of doing that to our right-wing readers. And then what she's really upset, of course, about is that I am not on the left. So she says that I believe that, that transgender people have a mental illness, and then she says that's just terrible. Okay, have I been unclear about my perspective on this? There's a video of me that's been seen 35 million times talking about this, like literally 35 million times. So I've not been unclear about this. And she finishes up by saying, I reached out to Mr. Shapiro to ask him about the Columbus Day video. She did. And I emailed her back the statement, which we had already put out or were putting out at the time. And then I added a one-line comment. She said, he sent over a statement apologizing for it, saying it engaged in broad-based stereotyping, which he also posted on Twitter. In the email, he added, quote, I think there's a lot of political ground to be gained in pandering to your own side and confirming their biases. I strive not to do that. And then she finishes, and yet he and vast swaths of the conservative right who decry groupthink still do. To tell strident college students to examine their own politics and embrace real debate is brave. To insist on the same from those on the right would be even more courageous. Um, again, she has not watched a single speech I have ever done on the right. Not one. I guarantee you, she has not watched a single speech I've done on campus. If she has, then I don't know if she had the mute on, but that is patently crazy. Okay, the idea that I have not told college students on the right to examine their own politics, half of my speech at Berkeley was devoted to why the alt-right is stupid and why identity politics of the right is bad and why if you think that Mexico and China are responsible for your lost job, you're probably wrong. Okay, so again, all of this is just dumb. All of this is just dumb, but it demonstrates something that I think is more important, and that is that the left is so concerned with finding enemies that they will find enemies everywhere.